G'day, Troy Dane from WP Elevation, and I have the microphone in a new position. So for those who don't watch the podcast, this won't mean much to you, but I'm experimenting as always. Welcome to episode number 48 of the WP Elevation podcast. Uh, In this episode, we are going to meet Alex Moss, who is one of the directors at Fire Cask. His wife is the other director. That's interesting challenging and we're going to learn a little bit about how they manage that relationship. He's also co-founder of PDIG, which is a bootstrap WordPress development framework. Like, do we really need another development framework? Well, apparently we do. And we're going to find out why PDIG is different, unique, and what it has to offer. In this episode, you are going to learn how to overcome your fear of failure. And you will realize that even people as successful as Alex constantly battle the fear of failure and why taking action is the most important thing. Uh, You're also going to uh, see a very impressive list of clients that Alex has and a very impressive list of plugins that he develops that you can get for free in the WordPress plugin repository. Facebook comments, ring any bells. He's also giving away a unlimited, sorry, an unlimited, I'll get my English right. He's also giving away an unlimited license of the PDIG Bootstrap WordPress Development Framework, valued at $189. Stick around for details on how you can enter that competition a little bit later on. This interview is full of gold, and if you are not motivated to take action, to get off your behind and take some action and actually do some stuff at the end of this episode, then I can't help you. It's a cracker. Stay with us. Let's elevate. This is the WP Elevation Podcast. Helping WordPress consultants elevate. This episode of the WP Elevation podcast is brought to you by WP Elevation, the world's first business accelerator program for WordPress consultants. Seriously, if you are building websites for clients using WordPress and you are trying to build this business so that it can sustain you or you want to grow this business or you're at a point where you just want to hire more staff so that you can get off the tools and spend more time with your family, Whatever it is, we help you build the business you need to support the lifestyle you desire. Let me give you an example. Right now, it's the 4th of September. That is the date that this Alex Moss interview is being published. It's my birthday. I'm actually not here. I'm in Thailand on a beach somewhere getting a suntan. That's right. (laughs) And uh, we have just had a three-day mastermind group with the WordPress Elevation members Um, And I'm nowhere near my office, nowhere near my computer, nowhere near my business. I am chilling out, enjoying my birthday in the sun because we have a team and we have structure and processes and we have clients that allow the business to pretty much run while I'm not here. And it's just one example of the kind of thing that you can achieve if you too join WPElevation.com in my best radio announcer's voice. Uh, Get on over to WPElevation.com and find out more. Come join us. It's lots of fun inside. All right, Elevation Tip of the Week this week is guest blogging. Um, My personal experience is I have written guest posts for TalkMag, uh, the big WordPress news um, uh, blog uh, sponsored by WP Engine, and I've also guest blogged for You Gurus. And both of those experiences have been rewarding. They have uh, resulted in customers and they've resulted in, more importantly, great relationships and great friendships with the people over at YouGurus, Brent Weaver and the gang, and of course, Michelle and the gang at um, TalkMag. So I would definitely suggest guest blogging, and Alex in this interview talks about the reason he guest blogs is because he doesn't want to blog on his own website because people on his website already know him. He wants to get found by an audience who don't already know him, and that's the best reason to guest blog. Alex Moss, as I mentioned, is one of the directors at Firecask, and he is the co-founder of PDIG. Uh, he, he has overcome fear of failure. He has overcome fear of public speaking, uh, and he has overcome fear of looking silly, and he has managed to interview Matt Mullenweg and Mike Little, both the co-founders of WordPress, uh, which then got published on, that's right, not his blog. Why He said, why would I waste that on my blog? He gave it to Smashing Magazine, who said, thank you very much. We'll have that wonderful piece of content and link back to Alex. He's also posted guest blogs for Moz, Search Engine Watch, and eConsultancy. His client list is extremely impressive, as is the list of plugins he develops. This is a cracker of an interview, and I had all sorts of technical problems that Alex was very patient putting up with 
He was seamless. He was a consummate professional. I had a great time chatting with Alex. I hope you enjoy meeting him as much as I enjoyed meeting him and getting to know him and learning from him. And seriously, the big takeaway in this interview is just take action. Just get out of your own way long enough and just bloody well do it. Whatever it is you're thinking about doing, it's not going to get done if you think about it. Just do it. I know it's the uh, Nike cliche, but it's true. Just take action. And he says this great thing in this interview. Look out for it. He says, you know, the best way to overcome fear is to take action. And the moment you start taking action, you forget about the thing that you're afraid of and you're getting stuff done. You kill two birds with one stone. It's genius. Without further ado, let's go meet Alex Moss. G'day, Troy Dean from WP Elevation, and I'm very pleased to have with me all the way from Manchester, Alex Moss from Firecast and PDIG. Hey, Alex, how you doing? Yeah, not too bad, thanks. And you? Awesome. I'm very well, thank you. Uh, now, just a bit of context. What time of day is it where you are right now? It's 8.30 in the morning. And it's Tuesday where you are, yeah? Um, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. yeah, it is, yeah. So we're at least on the same day. It's 5.30 here in Melbourne, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, so at least we are on the same uh, day of the week, which is good. Now, uh, for those that don't know, Alex is one of the directors at uh, Firecask, which is a WordPress agency based in Manchester, and also founder of PDIG, which is a bootstrap theme framework for WordPress, which we're going to talk a lot about. And in fact, Alex has very kindly sponsored a unlimited site license of the PDIG bootstrap framework, which is valued at $189. So stick around for details on how you can enter that competition a little bit later on. All right, Alex, before we start talking about all things WordPress-ish, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Well, when I was a young kid, um, it was more like, oh, I want to be a policeman or a doctor. And then as I grew up, I realized how much work was involved and I turned into a really lazy kid. But one thing I was actually interested in was art and animation particularly. So I was always a lover of cartoons and even when I got into my low teens, I was still embarrassingly watching things like Johnny Bravo um, because it just in intrigued me, especially 2D animation. And even today, I still watch a new episode of The Simpsons every single week. And that creativity and, and you know, using the computers itself to, to produce that animation, especially the way it was going in the 80s and 90s, um, just generally got me into computers. So it's something that I wanted to do, but unfortunately in school, they don't take animation as seriously as drawing a sphere with a pencil. <laughs> yeah, it's ironic, isn't it? When, yeah. when did you discover the internet and think, oh, hang on a second, there's something in this, I might have to uh, give this some attention? Um, I actually, I got my first computer when I was 13. Um, before that, I was into computers, but more gaming. So I had an Amiga 500 and I used mm -hmm. to play like Supercars 2 and all of those things. And I finally got a PC when I was 13 and I just so happened to just get the internet. The internet was just coming out then. So it was 1997-ish. So we were just getting it in the homes. And I remember having a six meter long extension cord <laughs> for my phone and it went over my parents' bed, and I used to start playing on the internet. So I got those CDs. I don't know if you got them in Australia. We got a CD in the post every day from AOL and CompuServe and those kind of um, things, and you get your 30-day trial. So as a teenager with no credit card, I was able to do my 30-day trial from CompuServe, go to AOL, then go back to CompuServe and so on. So that, that set me up, and that got me into the world of the internet as well as you know computers in general. Awesome. And what were you using when you first started using the internet? What were you using it for? Was it chat room stuff? Was it research? Was it websites? Was it email? What was the main usage? Um, it was actually just, it wasn't research. It was more like finding just more information out. So I was learning, but not educationally learning, if you know what I mean. So I was just learning more things that weren't covered in the normal education system, and and then I just started getting involved with HTML. So. I just kind of thought, oh, how are these people making these websites? And then I just started making websites and reading HTML and reading into it. It just interested me. And at the time, because at that part in my life and then school that I went to, they didn't embrace any of that quite then, that I had nothing to learn from. I didn't know it was actually important to know or, more importantly, a possible career path later on in life. Um, so I just messed around. And also I played a lot of Duke Nukem 3D <laughs> networking games. Um, I used the network up here called Wireplay, um, which I don't know, maybe some people around my age um, who were using it back then will remember. But that was kind of like the first social network that I came across. 
you know, you had your own username, you logged into a forum and you played a game together and then you chatted about it and that, that, that was great for that time. Yeah, yeah, awesome. What do you think it is? Like some people are just happy looking at the internet and when it first came out, they're just happy looking at all this stuff on the screen and being kind of amazed by the technology and then some of us want to look under the hood and some of us work out that you can view the source code and you can figure out how people are doing this. What do you think, like... Why do we look under the hood? And because not everyone does it. I mean, the majority of people don't look at source code. They look at it and their brain melts and they run away screaming. Whereas some of us go, "Hang on a second, this can't be that difficult." Why do you think we want to find out how it works? Um, it's that's an interesting question. I mean, why do people? Why do people like cars and engines? You know, it's it's one of those things. Knowing how something works and put together. Um, is really interesting. I don't know if you had it again in Australia. It was a great advert by Honda, and it was a bunch of parts that eventually made a song, and then it turned into the car. And you're thinking that's so interesting, even the way in which something isn't supposed to be used not to drive to make music still is able to do that. And yeah. and the other thing is, it's not hard to just open the hood. You know, yeah. I just opened it and I understood what was inside, mm. just like mechanical know how the engine works mm. and um i just went went from there i just didn't I, it was it was odd to explain it was mm. like it's like it, it is a language just like you would learn german and spanish and i just so happened to be able to learn it quite quickly unlike german and spanish mm. yeah 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 i do remember uh i do remember that ad and i think the tagline was something like isn't it wonderful when things just work yeah, yeah, and it is, and 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 it's supposed to be seamless. And funnily enough, that is our job as well. We're supposed to have extremely complex code in our work that for the user, which I always describe as my mum because she knows nothing. She still calls <laughs> a computer a machine. Yeah. That if she understands it, then yeah, then it's then it's going to work, and it is seamless, and it does just work that way. Yeah, it's a great litmus test. The mum, the mum litmus test is great, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I also use the mum litmus test for social media. Don't post anything on social media that you wouldn't want your mum to see. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Except that people really do do that. And uh, it's very odd the way in which people use social media today. I see a lot of people taking photos of their kids, which is very nice. But mm. when that kid's 20, what's that? What's that person? How's that person going to socially interact with their history? Yeah. You know, I've got about five pictures of me before I was five, and mm. we're going to be those old people that go, Do you remember a fax machine? Yeah. And those kids are going to, you know, have an internet as a normal, everyday thing, and it's going to really change the way that, you know, socially they interact in a generation's time. Mm. It's really interesting, isn't it? There's something like, the, we are way off script here, by the way, uh, but I'm happy. Um, there's something like 25% of teenagers in South Korea are undergoing some kind of counselling for internet addiction. They come home from school and they communicate via devices, usually you know, via some kind of social network on the computer or a smartphone, to then organise to meet at the local playground. You know, when I was a kid, you just went to the playground after school and there were other kids there. But now they're yeah. communicating, they're, they're absolutely addicted to their devices. And yeah, something like 25% of teenagers are undergoing some kind of counselling to get them off the internet. That's just bizarre. It is. And, and to be honest, it's our fault as parents. I mean, I'm not a parent yet, but I don't, although it's easy for me to say without a kid, mm. I'm not going to want my child on the internet as much as they want at the age of four. Mm. You know, I don't want that to happen. I want to have, I want to bring my children up with the upbringing that I was brought up technologically. Mm. You know, there's no reason for a five-year-old to have a Facebook account. You know, mm. it's actually illegal, obviously, yeah, but yeah, yeah. You know, there's things that kids do on the internet that just really didn't, don't have to happen quite yet. You know, That's right. chill out. There's a lot of time. That's right. Get in the sandpit when you're five years old. There's plenty of time to discover the internet. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, yeah. So when did you discover WordPress? Do you remember the first time you saw the WordPress dashboard? I don't remember the first time I saw it, but I remember the lead up to it. Um, it was only about six years ago. So I think for some people, I'm quite a late entry into the WordPress world. And I first designed websites um, through uni as a job because I couldn't be bothered getting a proper job. Um, so I started building websites because no one else I knew built websites or even knew anything about HTML. I was the designer, the developer, the business guy. I, did, I learned to do everything. Um, and when I did that, I didn't use CMSs at the beginning. I was doing flat out PHP. Um, and then I started looking in CMSs. I found one called CMS Made Simple, which is a very, um, it's not very popular. Hardly anyone, I think one person who I've ever talked to about it knows what it was. Um, 
and then that was great but then I started getting impatient with it and I did a little shop around and I came across WordPress and it won uh, between you know the top three CMSs that I found, I found so it was really interesting to go in and go oh this is so much better and less clunky and there's not as many options and the options that are there are easy to understand and more importantly I can communicate it to my client you know if my client can use it then it's that that's all I need to know and I'll mm. save a lot of money not doing that consultation mm. I remember the media library like the image upload button I'd been trying to I'd been trying to write that solution in PHP for months and I came across the image upload button in WordPress and I went, that's it. I'm never writing PHP again in terms of like, why would I write this? It's already here. It's out of the box and it just works, you know? Yeah, it was great. And so many things that you needed were just in, in core. Mm. And that's what was amazing. And, and also the community. That's what I found in, in the other one. You went in a forum and you'd ask a random question. You wouldn't hear anything for three days or it'd yeah. be vague or, you know, <laughs> oh, we'll put that feature in in the next nine months. And yeah. with WordPress, there was so many plugins and someone had created a solution for near enough everything, um, mm. which is what I thought was amazing about it. It's not just about core. It's about everything that goes around it. Mm. The plugin, We're going to talk more about the plugin architecture in a moment. The plugin architecture is definitely, I was actually on a, Call this morning on the on a marketing mastery summit, whatever that is. I was a guest speaker on there talking about WordPress, and uh, I was saying the plugin architecture is the I think the reason that, that WordPress has exploded and now owns the you know the market share. And we'll talk about that in a moment because you are the author of quite a few plugins, which we're going to talk about. Um, before we get there, how do you describe what you do in one sentence? When someone says, "Alex, what do you do?" How do you what's your elevator pitch, so to speak? Um. It's hard to explain because I've got two companies. So I would say I'm one of two directors for an online marketing company and WordPress development company called Firecask. I'm also the co-founder of a WordPress theme framework called PDIG. And I also write for a number of online publications and speak at uh, industry conferences. There you go. That's quite a mouthful. But it's quite, but it's quite to the point, you know, like it's, there's no, I mean, there's no, it's not vague. It's very clear and very concise and people know exactly what it is you do. I'm interested in um, how often do you need to use the elevator pitch? Um, I still do because people still don't know. Um, I, I don't know. It's a weird one. When I go in, I still need to impress people um, when I'm pitching. And even if they've read up about me, I'm not just going to say, well, you've read up about me. You, you clearly know who I am. You know, Otherwise, you have that. Um, pompous attitude um, there's a very fine line with confidence and cockiness mm. um, so you still have to sell yourself you when you pitch if it, you're very lucky if you're the only ones pitching for it that there, there will most probably be someone else competitor especially with the area that I'm in um, I'm most likely going to know who my competitor is um, so I really really do need to make sure that I'm above everyone else's noise um and that's hard to do when everyone else has a loud voice as well <laughs> so uh i like that the fine line between confidence and cockiness i'm still not sure where that line is but anyway um what <laughs> um what do they say fake it till you make it um so so how do you cut through the noise how do you be more impressive than anyone else and without just doing it with sheer volume um i help people um, in in the community so by that I mean if there's a problem that someone doesn't know and maybe it's related to WordPress because I work in the search industry we're not all WordPress devs um, so just like the WordPress development industry not everyone knows about SEO so it's good to combine those two things and when you do you get less people who know what they're doing in equal amounts um, so I very much like to help people and I get help back and funnily enough those people more likely turn into some kind of business partner of some sort um, so there's lots of other agencies in the UK that I've worked with um, mainly because I finally gave back to so much I took away as a teenager <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice loop that you've closed there uh, we're going to talk more about your clients and your case studies and your approach uh, in, uh, in, in terms of freelancing and consulting in a little while what do you actually spend most of your time doing day to day? Are you in text editors writing PHP queries and code or are you doing business development, speaking at functions? What do you spend most of your time actually doing? 
Uh, I wish I was coding as much as I used to be, um, and I'm sure, and, and I've you know watched a few of these um, podcasts, and I see that everyone kind of does say that as well. Everyone's turned from a, just um, a coder into a business person who has to run a business, um, and then they create a team of people underneath them, and that's what I've turned into, that businessman I didn't think I would be five years ago so my, my day to day will include direction of development projects so I work with my lead developer Reese Wynn who um, he makes his own plugins and he's written a book about BB Press mm -hmm. um, we work together um, we usually make the spec together and Reese does most of the implementation with me overlooking and overseeing um, I also do that um, for all of our search retainer clients so we have SEO clients, and because I know stuff about on-site and technical, um, I'll direct all of that while my business partner will deal with all the social and content aspects of it. Um, other than that, general business matters, bookkeeping, invoicing, pitching, you know, all of those things that go hand in hand with um, a director of a, of a small company. Now, I notice, and I don't know this, so I'm putting you on the spot. I notice your business partner also has the same last name as you. I'm taking it she's either your sister or your wife. Uh, she's my wife, yeah. <laughs> there um, you go. And yeah. it says here that she won Young Businesswoman of the Year in the Women in Business Awards. That's, a, that's, no, mean, that's no mean feat. That's a pretty good achievement. Yeah, and I'm extremely proud of her. Um, I, I mean, when she, she came into the industry a bit after me, um, and I started to be a bit known by the time she came in, and I remember that whenever I would go to a conference and she was there, they'd go, oh, where's Alex? And now the tables have turned and whenever I'm somewhere, they go, where's Anna? Um, <laughs> and, and it's great. It's great to work with her as well because we get to have um, very important board meetings in the car on the way home um, and decisions get made really fast. You know, instead of going through about seven people in a larger company, you know, we can make decisions on the spot. Um you know, we've we've gone from interviewing to hiring someone in two hours right. because we're just there, um, and it's really good. And um, she's becoming better than me at certain things. <laughs> wow! And how do you find the whole working and living together thing? Like, do you, do you, like do you just do you have rules that you're not allowed to talk about work during certain hours? Or we wish it's always <laughs> it is it is always you never really turn off because especially as you know you know in this digital world you have clients up all hours we're dealing with different time zones you know I mean you and me we're at totally different times mm. of the day we've got clients in Australia and and LA so you know we're dealing with the next day in the morning and the previous mm. day in the evening and it's mm. all very busy but in the daytime specifically we sit at opposite ends of the office and we try not to communicate in the office unless we need to and generally our work's so different I'm so technical in development um, and she's so social and content that we only really need to meet now now and again when it comes to client work other than that it's just business decisions gotcha so it's very good uh, what do you spend most of your time uh, sorry I've already asked that question what's the one thing that keeps you awake at night emails from different time zones <laughs> <laughs> no but seriously I mean Fear of failure yeah. is always there. Um, yeah. It's always really? going to happen. Really? Um, uh, yeah. I mean, even even now, you know, when cash flow is fine and and you're still getting you know big clients in and everything, failure is always a fear that that I always will have, no matter what I do. And especially when you know in the in the startup world, you're more likely to fail than you are to succeed. Mm. Uh, and you know, after a year, most startups don't even make a profit. So mm. making a profit just lets me sleep a lot better. Um, but keeping clients happy as well, um, you know, because I've got a business that's both reliant on retainer work and one-off development projects. You know, the, the retainer work kind of fuels the company. Um, and if a retainer goes off for whatever reason, then you're kind of on a conveyor belt of clients. Mm. Um, and it's our job to minimize that as much as possible. Mm. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned fear of failure because, uh, so, you know, I'm fascinated with, I'm fascinated by people who are successful, but still have a fear of failure. There's something about, there's something, there's something about someone's makeup that either they either embrace the fear of failure and do it anyway, or they let the fear of failure get the better of them and they never ship anything out the door. What do you think it is that gives you the ability to say, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of failing, but I'm going to have a crack anyway. Well, I think there's a difference between fear and stress of failure. Um, if you let it um, 
take over, then you're not going to get anything done. And stress is a waste of time. The, mm. While you were stressing for half an hour, you could have you could have <laughs> solved something that reduced that stress. So I try not to think about it as much as possible by doing more work. Right. So you're kind of killing two birds with one stone. Um, but it's just always there because the more the more successful you are, the more you have to lose. Um, and you don't want, especially in our industry, where everything's so you know extrovert and you're very confident in what you in what what you do. Failing, you know, hurts that confidence, and some people don't like coming back from that, or you know, find shame in it. Um, I personally don't, but then again, I haven't witnessed a massive failure that's risked you know my livelihood. I really like uh, what, what you said here about. Um and I just want to reiterate this point, and I'm going to make it a point in the show notes to mention this, that the way to overcome the fear is to take action and to actually do something, get moving and do something. And in the process of doing something, you kind of forget about the fear and you actually get some stuff done. Yeah. I mean, there was one guy who I was in uni with who um, he didn't want to, he just wanted an extension on his uni work all the time. So he went to the doctors and he faked a doctor's note and he got an extension of a week. And I'm thinking, but the time you took to get that extension, you could, you could have just done it. You could have just handed it in on time. It's like, no, 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 but I did it. And, and you're thinking, but you, you took so much passion into getting that extension. You, you great, that's great focus, but, but you're doing it in the opposite way. Yeah, yeah. So that the focusing on on something negative isn't going to get you anywhere and it'll just leave you in the same place or worse. Yeah, so you'd be better off actually focusing on what you need to do because you, the, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing, I, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you have to do during the day that you don't really want to do. The thing I've learned over the years is not doing it is not going to make it go away. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, inbox zero is impossible. Um, that yeah. those, those little things, but you need to, I find that it's all those little tasks that, that pile up. Uh, accounting is is a great example. You know, I don't want to every single week be sorting out my accounts, but I know that if I do it on a Monday morning, I've only got a little bit to do. Mm -hmm. um, unlike what I was doing at the beginning was waiting till the quarter was up and my accountant would be emailing me saying, you have um, 36 hours to get three months worth of accounting done. And that's stressful. And that time that I took, you know, it took me ages. Yep. And that's time that I wasn't dealing with clients. Um, and collectively, it took longer than just doing that thing on Monday morning every week. So management of larger projects and cutting them into smaller projects is important for me. That's great advice. Um, what do you do when you're not working? How do you chill uh, out? How do you reset your brain? I try to shut down my brain. Um, it's, it's Some people relax by you know playing Sudoku, and I don't. I like to do the dumbest things possible um, and try not to engage my brain so it can have a little a little nap. Yeah. Um, so I watch a lot of TV, yeah. I eat, drink, yeah. um, I travel and I sleep a lot, you know, yeah. I, that and, and I go out with friends. Um, it's just one of those, I try not to talk about work when I'm out right. and it's, it's, it's very hard to manage but once you master it, it's great. Um, that's why I love holidays so much, you know, if you really turn yourself offline. Um, which I'm really going to try and do this time. Um, it really is good, and the best thing of all is when I'm on holiday. I think of the best epiphanies. You know, when you're away from the office for about mm. just over a week, you start thinking of all these things you would never, ever, ever think about at home. Yeah. And every single time we have thought of something, we've ended up going with it. Um, I realise now, now that I'm coming close to a holiday, and uh, I can't wait to think of my next epiphany. Yeah. But it can't get those epiphanies without downtime you know taking your brain out and having a look at it from a third person yeah absolutely because it when you're in the trenches doing the day-to-day -day stuff it's i know it's such a cliche but you can't see the forest for the trees because you just you're just pedaling so fast to keep everything going and you do, you do actually need to take some time out and look at the business from a higher level and holidays are great for that i couldn't agree more yeah. um if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing in the business right now and i'm talking specifically about fire cask what would it be um more time internally for internal projects. So there's a, I've got a whiteboard with all of these like domains and concepts that we've bought and thought of. And you know, there's just like um, a great WordPress plugin idea I have. It's only one sentence, but it's merely saying it creates about nine months of work. And <laughs> because th there's no like budget for it, yeah. technically it's all internal then it kind of just gets put to the bottom of the list because some massive client job comes in and, you know, they're paying good money. I've got to 
keep my clients happy. I'm not saying, well, hold on, I'm creating, I'm, de I'm developing something that has absolutely no use possibly. Um, you know, it might not work, but, you know, we'll get to your work soon. Um, mm. It's hard to do that. And I wish that we had more time to do that. And it's hard to do that resource and time for people. Um, I've seen many companies just high, over hire um, and then they find out a few months later there's not, not enough work because mm. all of that internal stuff's done. And now what do you do? Mm. Um, so I like to very much grow slowly, but with that comes a price of there's not enough free time for my staff, um, which is which is hard. But everyone enjoys the job, hopefully. Mm. And do you do you all work together in the same office, or are you all remote? Um, no, we're all in the same office. Um, so there's two. There's me and Anna who are the directors. We've got a couple of account managers and um, content writers, got someone in charge of social, and we've got Reese the developer as well. So, and, and we're all just based in Manchester, so we all just come in into central Manchester, and it's very good because we all get along like a crazy weird family. Wow, that's awesome. That's, that's like, sounds like a traditional old school kind of business. It, it is. And yeah. We have a physical location. What's going on? I yeah, mean, yeah. I meet other people. You know, um, I, when I go to WordCamp, I meet I meet like the guys from Human Made and yeah. Code for the People and stuff, and and they're all completely remote in multiple countries. And mm. it seem it seems easy, but I'm sure they've got their own challenges. You yeah. know, um, I mean, I've worked remotely with people, and sometimes you do lose that disconnection. Um, so they must. I'm sure they must all have very very harsh. Um, guidelines involved to make sure that everyone keeps on communicating. Yeah, I think there are definitely um, pros and cons for each. And you know, the funny thing is, I, when I started out as a developer, I, in fact, I was talking to one of our customers this morning who's the same. He's like, I just want everyone to leave me alone. I want to sit in front of my computer and do my work, right? And I'm like, I totally understand that I get that. And that's how I used to be. And the older I get, and the more mature our business gets, the more I want people in my office, the more I realize that if you're bouncing ideas off people and feeding off other people's energy, the 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 sum is greater than the the you know the what's the saying the the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's not to say that I love working at home. I mean, I'm at home today, um, and I get a lot of work done on my home days. But you also need an office as well. Mm. Um, I mean, for startups specifically, I'd say go to shared space. There's a place called Tech Hub here in Manchester, and yep. I know they've got a few. Um, and those places are great because you have that remote working thing and you don't have to be sat in your living room. And some people really don't like it. I mean, mm. I've just grown up, as I mentioned before. I just built websites through you know, school and through uni for clients. So I've kind of had that experience for many years of, of working by yourself. Um, and therefore working at home. So I'm quite self-controlled with that. But some people love it, some people hate it. But I find it's good to have that mix. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. All right, let's talk a little bit about Firecask and um, and uh, PDIG. Sorry, I almost forgot mm -hmm. the name there. Let's talk about Firecask. I'm just looking at your case studies on your website. Um, yeah. And, you know, you've got some pretty big clients. You've got The Poke, which is the UK's largest comedy website. You've got 123 Reg, which even I know about, which is UK's number one domain name registrar and web hosting company. Harry Casino, Visit Blackpool, Expedia EAN, Amy Winehouse Foundation. How the hell do you get these clients? Um, most of them have been through simply being known within a small group. So um, The Poke, we were selected because... You know, they, they were given a WordPress development job and we, we were headhunted essentially as, as people who could create the bespoke code. And I think someone inside the building knew who I was. Um, and that's been because of all the previous work I've done with WordPress. Um, one, two, three, Reg, again, kept, they, they came to me. Um, Visit Blackpool came to us. And all of these people came to us except for the Amy Winehouse Foundation. I went to them. Um, the reason was after Amy passed away, um, um, Amy's father, Mitch, um, announced that he was going to open the foundation and someone decided within five minutes or while that press conference was still going on to buy all the domains. So, you know, unfortunately, people do take advantage of unfortunate situations like that. And um, they bought all the domains. And I, I happened to know Amy's cousin through family connections. And I ended up speaking to Amy's manager and and saying, I, I want to help. I'm not charging you or anything. I just, I hate it when that stuff happens and you clearly, your family grieving, take away all this fame of, of who she was 
um, you know, you guys are just trying to do something good, trying to create um, a charity based based on uh, on doing something more constructive with people with addiction and and so on. And someone just decides to buy the domain out, and um, they appreciated that. And um, after that, they they ended up did buying it, I think, off the guy, which is a shame. But they needed them quick, and um, and then I just carried on consulting with them. And now um, Amy's brother Alex and and her and and his wife's actually quite quite good friends with us now. Um, and it's just really nice to to know that that consultancy does go a long way. Wow. So there's kind of a, an overarching theme here, which is. The more helpful you are, whether it's within a certain network of other developers or other agencies or other people in the tech space, or whether it is actually just going direct to clients that you want to work with, the more helpful you are, the more chance. It sounds like you're not kind of in there, you know, asking for work. You're in there offering value and adding value and helping right from the get go. Yeah, um, and that, especially at the beginning when you can afford to be a yes man, um, you, you can do that. And I would suggest doing that when you haven't got the reputation that you want to achieve. So at the beginning, I mean, I did it with plugins. Um, my first plugin I made was because I didn't find a plugin that was that achieved what I wanted to achieve. So I wanted to create the solution and then share it in the repo. And, and that's what got me known as a plugin developer. And, and it is essentially plugins are, what are helping people. You know, that is it. You're not getting paid to put it in the repo. You're part of a community and you're helping that community out. And people will thank you if you do a good job of it and help those people. It's exactly the same with getting a new client. Um, the le- Oddly enough, the less I think about money, the more success I seem to get um, when, you, when you're not going in. Oh, I want a big account and so on. I mean, recently I traveled to New York and I just connected with a few people on LinkedIn before I went. And one person I spoke to, I didn't do any homework on whatsoever. I just connected with them. I just knew the company name and their and their role within that company. And the day before I started looking into them, I had, wow, these people are massive. These are the people who PR, you know, all of Scorsese's movies. Like, who, what, what have I just done? Where am I going? What, 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 who am I meeting? And it, but if you, if you forget about that, you tend to not stress. Um, I did that in interviews as well um, before I got my own agency. My, my, motto was if i can get the interviewer to swear then i've got the job yeah and and every and oddly enough every single time the interviewer swore i got the job yeah um it was just making them relaxed and making them feel that they aren't being sold is actually the best sales tactic so let's talk about the plugin repository i did a quick search and found your wordpress.org profile right alex Mm -hmm. moss um, member since July 4th, 2012, and here are the plugins that you are author of. And <laughs> the one that everyone will know, of course, is Facebook comments, 403,000 downloads from yeah. the WordPress. Here's my question. We've got a few plugins that have been downloaded hundreds of thousands of times too. How do you handle support for someone who downloads the Facebook comments plugin, plugs it in, and then goes, oh, it's not working? How, what, like, what systems have you got up what systems you got in place to make sure that you don't spend your entire life helping people install this plugin for free? Um, make it solid. Make sure that there are a few holes as possible. I mean, Facebook comments actually is quite a simple plugin. You know, if any of you guys download it, you'll see, especially the front end code. You know, there's not a lot to it, and generally, any conf- any anything that goes wrong are either conflicts with other plugins. Um, or the theme itself, or it's an issue coming from Facebook. So the most popular one I have at the moment is the comments box isn't responsive. And that's because Facebook keep on changing the way that it's output um, with their own SDK. And because of that, I can't help. So having a good Q&A section, answering everything before they email you or contact you in a forum is, is the best thing that you can do. Um, also, try and have your own management tool for dealing with that support and even though it's not really a tool I use um, an app called feeds on on my Mac and that that just um, I just basically um, subscribe to the RSS feed of the support of all of my plugins and then I just get a little notification rather than than get bombarded with emails staying on top of them is extremely important and um, updating them if there is a large issue but generally with my plugins I've not had Massive issues because none of them are extremely um, complex in code. You know, I've, I'm, I'm no W3 total cache. I don't even want to open that. You know, that that's the kind of heavy stuff that 
that some plugins do have, but mine are generally lightweight to the point they they fix one very specific solution and that's it. How did you? Because you've got a, you've also got Twitter feed embedded timeline WordPress plugin. You've got Facebook like and share button. They're the three big ones that, that get downloaded a lot. How do how do you choose? How do you know? Okay, I'm going to make a new plugin here. Is it to is it to scratch your own itch and solve a problem that you've got with a client site, or is it just something that you think would be useful for other developers? Um, it, generally, the latter. It, I mean, I made Facebook comments because no one else was making it to the spec that I wanted. It wasn't simplistic. It was usually bunched with something else. Um, so I just made it. And all of those downloads are completely organic. I didn't market that at all. I was very surprised to, to see so many people. And funnily enough, when Facebook released their official plugin, um, that was amongst a lot of other things. So comments was one thing inside the whole general Facebook thing. So you can have the like button, the share button, the recommendation box, the Facebook connect. And a lot of people uninstalled mine, which is fine. Um, and then they used theirs and then came back to mine. Yeah, I, I was um, one of them. I was one of them. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, and why did you do that personally? Because all I wanted was the Facebook comments. I didn't want all the other bloat. Exactly. And and funnily enough, you know, some people, and they, they are successful sometimes, that all-in-one encompassing plugin that can do everything for you. You know, Yoast SEO mm. is a mm. great example. Mm. It's got a hell of a lot of features um, and there's not too much blow and you can disable things. But sometimes you just want one thing that does one particular thing and you don't want anything else. I don't want the all of these shiny other features that you really didn't want. But here they are, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just wanted the features, and 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 that was it. Um, yeah. So that that's that's how it started. And yours worked out of the box first time. Plugged it in, it worked. I couldn't, I couldn't get the Facebook official Facebook plugin comments to bloody work. So I went back to yours because I knew yours worked. <laughs> I kind of thought, well, I should use the official Facebook one because it's bound to be better supported and it's bound to be better integrated and all that. And it just wasn't. I just couldn't get it to work. So I went back to yours. Um, interesting, well, isn't it? The original yeah, the original idea for the official Facebook uh, plugin was just to do the comments, and um, I spoke to Facebook about it um, because they obviously were aware of my plugin and spoke to me about you know what what I was doing with mine and and what I wanted to achieve. And the one thing that I did want to achieve was syncing those comments with the WordPress comments, you know, pulling it all in, and it was a massive job. Um, but then they just went away and they obviously thought, well, we, we won't just make the comments plugin, we'll make the all encompassing. And that to me is the one mistake that they may have made because, you know, as you said with support, how do I support something? I make it solid. But if I put an all encompassing in, I've got to make essentially 12 different features solid and someone's always going to have an issue with something. And, you know, everyone knows who's made a plugin. It doesn't matter if yours is the most concrete plugin. You, they will probably be installing it on with something else that isn't concrete and conflicts mm. with your thing. So um, it's how to manage that and make people happy when you know that there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. Let's talk about, <clears throat> I want to talk about um, PDIG for a minute and then I want to loop back to, to Firecast and hopefully this will make sense. When, tell for those that don't know, for the uninitiated, tell everyone in you know a couple of sentences, what is PDIG? PDIG is a WordPress framework um, that integrates bootstrap completely um, so it doesn't just load the CSS it, um, in, it it brings in all the features and you can use them pretty much anywhere so we have short codes for things like all the buttons and the forms and so on so we, what, what we try to do is just in, is, is marry them completely as much as possible be respectful to the WordPress core code um, and create enough options that makes it flexible for people even without code coding knowledge whatsoever to just make a simple customized version of their website so they can have sites that don't look like pdig out of the box essentially but they can colorize it and change the fonts and and do all these things um, and also it has social integration so it's got social structured data in there already um, it connects to the rel author attribute you know the um on the search engine results pages when it has a picture of the author which google have actually now taken away after the past week because they said it decreased ctr but we won't get into that. Wow. Um, it's all got all, all of that involved. And in your author bio, if, if in your profile, if you just enter your Twitter username, it automatically adds the follow button in the author bio. All, all of those little nice things that I never found in another framework. Um, 
and I kind of created it again because I wanted to solve a problem. Um, I actually wrote the spec about three years ago on a bus in Croatia and I was on holiday, you know, another <laughs> epiphany moment. And um, I just thought I hate some of the frame frameworks I was using. I was using Thesis at the time and it was great for, for the time being. And I just found that there was more and more things that were, weren't there out of the box when they should have been. And that was that was like quintessential. A dev has made this without potentially having SEO knowledge. And I figured that the SEO knowledge I had could very, very much go into how a framework can work. And everyone who's used it has has been loving it and found all the customizations. And particularly the early adopters, we've been able to you know go around problems that people have. And when we were making it, we said, "What's a bugbear of yours as an SEO? You know, um, what what don't you have that you could really, really have? And if you install the theme, what do you want from it?" So we've taken feedback before it was even built, um, and that, that that's that's a really important thing. Um, and obviously, I know know there's other, you know, bootstrap related frameworks out there, um, but I personally feel as though we've got the most feature rich and flexible. So this is the obvious question. Uh, there are two questions here. Do you, are people using PDIG to build client themes or are theme developers using PDIG to build commercial themes that they're then reselling? Um, a bit of both. I mean, um, I give out the framework to a few people, you know, who I know and I know that can, they can experiment with it. Um, and some have just made, made it very simple, uh, you know, and just changed the colorization and fonts with the options. Some have gone all out and created their own child themes um, within Firecast. Now you know everything we do now is within Fi is within PDIG, and and we just have a load of child themes, and that that's what what we do. Um, and that's obviously a plan for PDIG is you know more people will create child themes, and eventually there'll be a marketplace for ah, it. Ah, that was my next that was my next question. Is uh, I see that the you know the PDIG framework itself is. For sale, but my next question is: Will there be a, a a marketplace of child themes? Yeah, I mean it's only early days with PDIG, so there's not much out there at the moment. So we didn't want to create a marketplace with about five child themes. You know, sure. I want that to be choice. Um, so I'd rather do that over time. Um, I'm talking with the co-founder about what to do to help people make child themes, and we may be thinking about creating a free version that is very very stripped down in terms of features. But it still does everything like has you know all the hooks and and all the short codes that you need. So a designer developer um, can use it, can use a free version, create a child theme without having to own the official version. Um, and then if they want to buy you know the main pro version, then then they can do. So I'm reading. There's a blog post here about why I built a WordPress framework. Uh, it's actually yeah. by the looks of it, it's a presentation that's on SlideShare. Um, the obvious question is, you know, why do we need, maybe we don't, but why, you know, why should we be looking at this as a potential theme framework when we have so many theme frameworks at our fingertips? What is it about this that makes it unique or that differentiates it from all of the others that are available? Um, the code quality and the amount of features without bloat. So um, the amount of times I've gone on to um, very popular, well-known theme directories back in the day and bought a theme for $99 and I'm like, wow, this is amazing, $99 and I get this greatly designed website and then you open the hood and, and you get very annoyed at what's going on under there. You know, very, very simple things and I remember one that I bought off a directory that I won't name. Um, the support was terrible because they're all third parties. I even had to use... Um, a third-party ticketing system, and I said, "What's going on? Where, where, why, why is this certain function not happening? This WordPress function?" And they went, "Oh well, you know, well we only updated it then, and it wasn't around when we updated it when when we made the theme in 2010." I went, "Really? Because WP and Q Script's been around since before 2010. I can assure you. I mean, here's a link to the date on WordPress.org that they confirm that this came out, and you don't hear a reply." And, and you realize that these guys aren't WordPress developers. They are developers who happen to have found a marketplace where they realize they can get a, quite a bit of money potentially mm. from just doing mm. some job that they did in the past and just pressing copy and paste and shoving a couple of hooks. So yeah, here's WP head and WP footer and off you go. You know, they, they don't understand the theme requirements. Um, and that's something that I made sure that before we started developing PDIG that I was assuming 
I had to work in the frame of mind that it was going into the repo, that yeah. it had to fulfill those requirements. So all of that is basically theme, theme requirement ready. Um, and that's the one shame about all the other themes that are out there. Mm. I wrote a post for Search Engine Watch um, about how to choose trustworthy themes and plugins and authors. And there's a few tips in there um, if anyone isn't very experienced in trying to find a good plugin or theme. Awesome. I'm going to make a note of that and stick it in the show notes. It is Alex Moss Search Engine Watch uh, theme. I'll, I'll Google that and get a link for it. You write for some other blogs, right? How did that come about? Was that something that you... Because I want to talk a little bit about the fact that you write and that you present at uh, functions like Brighton SEO. We were talking off camera. Is this a deliberate thing that you've gone looking for this work or have people tapped you on the shoulder and said, hey, Alex, you know a bit about this stuff. Can you come talk at my event or can you come write on my blog? Um, speaking is something that's relatively new. I've only done it a few times actually mm -hmm. um but i'm getting it was mainly lack of confidence in talking mm -hmm. um and now i'm just doing it more and more and i'm getting more confident i think brighton seo was the one for me that that kind of opened it up as in my confidence um mm -hmm. because i didn't realize until i got there that there was about 400 people um, and that all the seats were gone and there were people standing behind the people who were seating and you're like, wow. I think if you just play the video, I think that the first thing that you hear me say, shit, there's a lot of people here. And, and I didn't realize that the microphone was on. And, and, but I realized that five seconds after you're into that speaking, all of that fear goes away. Um, but gen generally, I've asked, but now I'm starting to get asked to speak at places, um, which, which is a good thing to do. And blog posts, again, was something that I... I asked if I could do something. So with e-consultancy, my very first post with them was, oh, do you mind if I just write about this? And I spoke to the editor. And then after that, he goes, oh, here's a login. Whenever you want to write something, just write it. And then it'll go into editorial and that's it. So I just kept on doing it for different ones. Um, one thing I don't do is blog on Firecast or PDIG because I'm more of a, a guest author. You know, I like writing on other publications where the audience isn't just people who already know who I am. Um, I want to get found by people who have no idea who I am. Mm. Because who do will read that post anyway. This, that there, I usually say this, but that there is worth the price of admission alone, ladies and gentlemen, and for a free podcast, that's uh, not too bad. But did you hear what Alex just said? I'm just going to reiterate that. You tend not to blog on Firecast because you want to get found by people who don't already know you, and that's why you're blogging at places like Search Engine Watch and eConsultancy and other places because you want to get you want to get found by a, a larger audience. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, it's it, why would you want to write on your company blog once a month? And and more importantly, the audience may not be right for it. Um, sometimes it's good and sometimes it's not, but I want more people than just people who know me to read it. So, um, I can't remember what month it was. I think it was March. I was able to have an interview with both Matt Mullenweg and Mike Little. Uh, it's the first joint interview in, in quite a few years. That would have been a waste on my company website. Why would, why would I want to place it there? So, um, I spoke to Smashing Magazine and they published it instead. And why is that? Because Smashing Magazine's readership is much bigger and it's not for me and my own marketing technique of getting myself out there because I actually want wanted more people than my own readership to read and a joint interview with the founders of WordPress on a WordPress section of a very uh, big publication in the industry. Why wouldn't I want to do that? Mm. Um, and that, that's what everyone else, again, it's helping people, you know, if there's anything in that interview that helps someone that I will never have been able to have interacted with, if I published it on my own site, then I've done my job well. It's funny. I think that's how I discovered you. I think that's when you first popped onto my radar because I saw that interview going around. I'm like, hang on a minute. Who's this guy interviewing Matt Mullenweg and Mike Little? God <laughs> damn, I wanted that interview. That was mine. That was mine. <laughs> and then I, that's when I started finding out who you were. And I went, oh, okay, now it all makes sense. Let's get this guy on the podcast so I can hang shit on him for interviewing Matt and Mike. <laughs> yeah, well, it was it was by chance that I got it. I mean, I met I met Matt at uh, WordCamp Europe in Leiden. Um, in yeah. November. It was October last year. Did we meet? Um, did we meet there? Uh, I don't know. Did we? Oh. Did we? Oh, no, we oh, no, no, we couldn't have done. I don't no. know. I would have remembered meeting right. you. I'm, we, I'm a few people there, but I don't remember meeting you there. Huh. Um, but it was there that I met him. I don't know if you met Matt there as well, did, but yeah, yeah. it just so happened. 
I just so happened that three weeks later, I went to the Web Summit in Dublin and Matt was there as well. So I'd never met him. And then all of a sudden I meet him twice in three weeks. So um, I was able to interview him there. And, um, and Mike, I didn't realize when I was looking into the history of WordPress, and what one of the founders is, is 45 minutes away from me in Manchester. He lives in Stockport. What, what's all this about? And I just ended up speaking to him and, uh, you know, I've met Mike a few times. He's a great guy. Mm. Um, I know that you've interviewed him on one of your previous podcasts as well. And, you know, he, he has some very interesting um, ideas and he's a very, very clever man. Um, mm. I mean, I would suggest to anyone, go, go and read the uh go and read the interview because it's extremely interesting both from Matt and Mike both from someone who's in automatic and outside of that whole automatic <clears throat> arena um, essentially he's just a consultant like, like I am yeah. um, but he you know he's the founder he knows his stuff yeah so did you did you have a moment where you were like who the hell am I to be interviewing Matt Mullenweg and Mike Little yeah all the time and and I just thought well you know you, you don't lose anything by asking do you um, so I just asked and they both said yes. And, and that's oddly enough, a lot of the success that we've had is, you know, you, if you have a client that's, that's, that you think's a bit over your head, don't, you know, it doesn't matter if you're that good and you're unique to someone else who's pitching, then why can't you compete against the big boys? Um, and that's why we have clients that we have, you know, we're a small agency and we don't do an all encompassing TV ads and video production and all of this, but we specialize in a very few niches and in those niches we excel in them and that's why you get known and get recognition and be able to get away with interviewing the two co-founders of the cms that basically puts food on your table it's awesome i love it i love it there's so much in there and i hope our listeners are getting as much out of this as i am um the reason i wanted to talk about your plugins and speaking and guest blogging and pdig is because i imagine all of that uh, makes a very credible story when you're talking to clients. I mean, it's very hard to argue with a WordPress consultant who produces a product that hundreds of other WordPress consultants around the world use on a daily basis. Yeah, um, and we're not the cheapest of consultancies, but we're not the most expensive. And if anyone haggles on price, it depends. You know, it depends on the person, it depends on the job and everything. But generally, you're thinking, well, you're clearly speaking to me for a reason. Um, and that reason isn't is is mainly because of the code that we do and the reputation that we have. If you want to get um, you know some freelancer in in the middle of nowhere who doesn't speak the same language as you, who's charging a tenth of the same job, there is a reason why that's happening. Um, and it's really annoying because in England, I find that for SEO as well, people say, oh well. Oh, you can do SEO for this price, but you know some company out in India is doing it for a quarter of that price, and and people seem to be very comfortable in outsourcing um, their work that represents their whole company. Essentially, you know, we're, we're designing sites for, to to run a whole online company, and they're willing to spend a quarter of the price and go out to to um, other countries that, in other normal circumstances, they they wouldn't go. So I know that we get people complaining about how in England specifically a lot of call centers, they shipped a lot of all the call center stuff into India and everyone got really annoyed. And you're thinking, I want to speak to someone in England. And you're thinking, well, it, you, you're paying bills to them. You, you're not really that important to, you know, Sky or something. Does it really matter? On, conversely, when it comes to their own livelihood, they're willing to give it to the same people. <laughs> I just don't understand that. Um, and you get what you pay for, you know, you, mm. if you pay more, you'll generally get better quality, generally. Yeah, yeah, generally, yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, um, let's do our Elevation Lightning Round. For those that don't know, WP Elevation is a business accelerator for WordPress consultants. So if you want to grow an agency and a consultancy just like Alex has, then WP Elevation is the place to, to be. Check out WPElevation.com for more. And in this Lightning Round, I'm going to ask Alex a series of quick questions, and he's going to give us a series of quick answers. Sound good? Quick answers. I'm not good at quick answers. <laughs> All right, what's the number one thing any freelancer or consultant needs to know? Oh, in short, the number one thing is that there are many things to know. Um, I, I would say, although there's a few things, number one, learn when to say no. Um, you've got to not be a yes man. As soon as you're a yes man, you'll be abused, trust me. Um, and always get your spec right. 
um, especially on a development project. Oh, can it just do this? Yeah, and then you find out it's about you know twenty extra hours more than you predicted. Um, and don't fight with each other. There's so much work out there that I don't even consider my competitors to be competitors. You don't win all your pitches. Just go to the next one and stop stressing about it. Good don't advice. let it kill, kill your enthusiasm. What's the best thing you've ever done to find new customers? Uh, recently, we did an event on the roof of our uh, offices. We've got a roof garden, um, and um, it's developed by Brumwood, a very large property company in, the, in Manchester. And we did an event for clients and prospective clients, and oddly enough, no peers, you know, no, no competition, which is what other people would do. They would hire all the competition, but we just got our clients and some people who were pitching to, and there are about seven different clients um, and about five different perspective, and that was about two weeks ago, and already three of those perspective clients have converted. And oddly enough, that's to, to show that you're doing a bit extra and you're not just saying, oh, here's a meeting, it does go a long way. And even though that did cost money and it scared me at the beginning, you know, three weeks later, I'm happy that we did it and we've got our return. So I would say invest in things, speak, you know, write for things, do everything that I've done when I was being yes man, but don't say yes. <laughs> what was the event? What was the structure of the event that you ran? Was it just a, a drinks on the roof or was it actually a presentation or? No, it was just drinks and drinks and barbecue on the roof from six till nine. And that was it, you know, and, and our clients spoke to our prospective clients and they were just a walking, talking recommendation. Um, especially when you get the, the extremely happy clients. There was one who came to us about a year ago um, he's, he's a hair transplant consultant, he's like an actual surgeon, he doesn't just uh, sell, sell the extensions online, he does operations, and um, and he was basically screwed over by three other SEO companies in the past, so when I was pitching to him, he already didn't have any confidence in not only me as a person, but as a company and as a vertical, um, and it took him quite a while to win us over, and now he loves us, and he likes telling other people that, and and that definitely helps. Recommendations go a long way. And make sure that you develop your LinkedIn profile as a result. That's my online TV. If, if I'm pitching ever, I go nosy on me, you know, and, and nosy on anyone else you, you're shopping around with. You know, once you've hung up from this call, search for Alex Moss and read up about me and read my 35 plus recommendations on LinkedIn because mm. they're genuine. Um, that's the best thing. You can't fake LinkedIn recommendations. Great advice. How do you stop competing on price? Um, I don't think about competing. Um, oddly <laughs> enough, I go in, I give them a price, and if they like it, they like it. If they don't, they don't. And maybe there's a small haggle, but ge generally, I don't think of competing. I don't think that someone else is walking into the same office 15 minutes after I leave. Um, and the less I think about it, the less paranoid I get and more confident I can be in the actual pitch. Whilst that competitor is thinking about how they're competing with me, <laughs> they can worry about that. Awesome. I love it. What was that fine line between confidence and cockiness? I reckon you walk that line perfectly, my friend. It's really hard. It's like that drunk walk, you know, when they make you when they make you walk like that with your fingers to your nose. You go a bit to the left and you go a bit to the right, but as long as as long as you're kind of on a straight and narrow, you're okay. That's gold. Uh, any tips on writing better proposals? Um, structure them specifically for each person. So don't template it too much. Um, and sell why, why are you better than the other proposal that they're getting? You know, sell, sell trust. You know, we, we kind of say, here's reasons why you should come with us. And I include those recommendations from LinkedIn and I link to my LinkedIn recommendations instead of saying, hey, here's Joe Blogs that there's probably just a picture of a guy from, you know, iStockphoto.com <laughs> telling me how great I am. These are actual people um, and even including a picture of those people in the proposal gives it that personal effect and, you know, people like people, not brands. We don't, we don't sell our company, we sell ourselves within the company. The company is just somewhere where we work. Awesome. Favorite tool for CRM? Um, I did use a combination of things um, like Google Docs. I did a pro I actually did everything in Google Docs from project management to CRM as well. So our project doc, um, I actually wrote a post on moz.com about a year ago with a template. If anyone wants to use it, it's free of charge, obviously. Um, but recently, we have um, been using Rike 
which is W R I K E. Mm-hmm. It's a free tool, but then there's you know subscription packages if you're a large team. Within a week, um, all of us have fallen in love with that tool. Um, there's everything from you know CRM process all the way to project management. You can time manage everything right within one dashboard. Uh, and it's all collaborative. So if there's a lead, you know someone in my team can go away and do some research and say search trends or or specification, and then they can just report it back to me for me to continue doing my work. It's fantastic. Um, also, we use Trello. Simpler tasks, which I'm sure everyone's heard of. If you don't, just sign up. It's amazing. Um, and Boomerang um, for Gmail. Mm. I don't know if you heard of Boomerang. I, yeah, I love, I love Boomerang. It. It's amazing. And um, you can get a free version. gives you 10 credits. And that lets you schedule posts, uh, schedule email, sorry, um, which is great as a developer. You know, I'm sure we can all... Um, we can all agree that most of us are nocturnal when we do some development work and I don't like sending emails at one in the morning. Mm. Um, so I'll schedule it to go at nine in the morning and by the time they reply, I've woken up, um, that kind of stuff. And of course, it brings back emails that you may have sent and if no one replies, it'll come back in two weeks and it's a great reminder. And even though it's not a tool, I consider it a tool because um, my memory is terrible and anything to help with that is uh, a tool for me. Yeah, we love Boomerang for Gmail. Big fans here. Uh, what's the best way to, I think you've answered this question, but what's the best way to keep a project and a client on track? Making um, making sure that if you're working with third parties that they're on top of things and making sure that if anything is delayed that the client knows before that delay has even happened that it might affect you. So we have KPIs uh, when we do um, search retainers. And say, for example, we haven't developed the site for whatever reason. So, you know, we'll get a Magento site and, you know, we, we, we do know how to do it, but we're no specialists in any way like we are with WordPress. And say it's with a third party company who made it originally and they don't do some change for six weeks, that's going to affect our KPI. So we need to make sure that everyone, not just the client themselves, but the people that the clients work with, are on top of everything and doing a weekly or bi-weekly call, just checking up over emails does keep everyone on track and making sure that they know that you're not dead. You know, just general presence is, is everything. Uh, any ideas for getting referrals from existing customers? I think you throw events on the rooftop, don't you? <laughs> yeah, so throw, throwing events, going to a, other events, um, writing, speaking, um, but I don't do any of those, you know, speak to my clients and say, hey, if you've got any of your clients who may need a website or may need online marketing, please send them to us. We'll give you a kickback, you know. It's an option that some people do, but we only really do it if they come up to us and it's worth it for us because um, it's all about, you know, kind of, we can tell in pitching, in the pitching phase whether that client's going to be for us anyway or not. And if it isn't, we may raise our price to either put them off or it's worth our while a bit more. Um, it's just m- many of these things, but generally we like to be as organic as possible. And we have no sales team, so everything comes from either word of mouth or the, or the odd cold email that Anna or I may send. Cool. And uh, final question in the elevation round. What's the number one thing you can do to differentiate yourself? Um, find your niche and, and, and make sure that you take advantage of it. So for me... I have that um, SEO and WordPress uh, marriage somehow. You know, I know I've, I've come from an SEO background, and up until say about a year or two ago, I never considered myself or advertised myself as a developer in any way um, because I I just know, although I did develop, I always said I was a bit more of a designer, even though I was terrible at design. And, and I went into search, and I was very good at that. But then once I started creating these plugins, um, I realised that I was developing. You know, so why can't I call myself that? So, you know, as you said before, my elevator pitch is very concise, but it's not just one thing. You know, I know there's a few of me. Um, you know, there's people like Yoast and Luminea and um, and people like that who do very similar stuff, but we're still in that niche. You know, mm. there's only five people that I know of in Europe that, mm. that do exactly what, what we do because of that. That already puts you ahead. Mm. Um and, and the fact that Yoast and the Luminae are in different countries bodes well for all of us, you know. Mm. Um, you know, um, Miriam's in Israel, and I've met her a few times. She's great, and but we're never going to step on each other's toes. That's right. And the world's a big place. There's lots of people, aren't there? And with that comes a lot of websites. Yeah. Noah Kagan, I saw him speak at a startup conference here in Melbourne a few months back, and someone was saying, you know, 
like what happens if someone gets hold of your idea and he said, you know, the world's a big place. There's lots of people. Yeah. yeah it's, and what is an idea really? You know, ever, ever, sometimes all of our, th- like my idea was to create a Facebook comments plugin, but is that really an idea? You know, someone else clearly did that before me. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just improving on something else. Um, and there's so many of us that everyone will improve their small little niche and they'll be good with that niche. And that's all that you need to know. And there's so many niches that you can do. Then you don't need to hog off someone else's. And and if there are quite a few people involved in that niche, then you can take advantage of it. I mean, on the outside world, online marketing is a niche, mm. you know, with people who aren't in it. And, but inside the world, online marketing is a very vast place where you can have journalists, social media, and technical people. You know, there's all this kind of stuff. So there's niches within niches within niches. Um, so find the one that you're good at and make yourself known for it. Yeah, and I'm very pleased that you also say niche and not niche. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't understand that. Maybe it's an English thing. Um, well, I, we I say know. Australians say niche, and you guys say niche, and, and the Americans say niche. So uh, it's it's definitely an American thing. There is no T in the word niche. No, no, and and they take out the letter U out of colour. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) we'll stick together, man. Every time I install anything on the computer, it's like I have to choose between English US or English UK language, and I'm always choosing English UK because I don't want spell check to automatically correct my spelling, which is already correct. Yeah, it's the left hand side of the road brain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Very good. Uh, What is the future for Firecast, and what is the future for PDIG? Um, the future of Firecask is to grow, but organically. Um, we just want it to grow to a point where it isn't too big and that we lose our way. We see that with a lot of companies who've grown from like, you know, 10 to 30 in two years. And by the time it's 30, bosses can't be asked with that deal anymore. And, um, and they don't, they have a bit too much to manage and things become too much of a mess. So we want to grow it slowly and to a point where it can basically look after itself without maybe me and or Anna being there, um, which is where I'll probably go into PDIG more, uh, more product-based solutions rather than service-based solutions, which is what Firecask is. Um, I want to develop more plugins and I want to develop more child themes and I want PDIG to become much bigger than it is today. Um, but at the moment, Firecast takes precedence, um, unfortunately. Um, but it's one of those things, you know, it's PDIG's kind of just a hobby that that kind of just evolved into something massive over the span of three years. Do you get nervous about, like, PDIG is built on the Bootstrap framework, right? And it's built on, it's a WordPress theme framework that incorporates Bootstrap. It's kind of a product that you're building on two other technologies owned by other companies. Do you get nervous that one day you'll wake up and Twitter will say, ah, you know that bootstrap thing? Well, we're not going to do that anymore. And uh, you know, uh, then all of a sudden it's like, whoops, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do think about that. But, I mean, differentiating ourselves by, from someone like Genesis, who, you know, everyone knows they're, a massive, they're, they're basically our main competitor, if you could call them that. They have their own framework and, mm. and their own CSS framework and that's great but i am not the best at css i am good and i understand it but i would never be able to make something as sophisticated and as slick as bootstrap so why would i um provide something that wasn't top notch Mm. when someone else is doing it Mm. and bootstrap i'm personally not too worried about it powers one percent of the web that's quite big if they really need needed funding they will get it easily, mm. um, and I'm sure it's not going away. I just chose something that's more future-proof. I chose the most future-proof CMS with the most future-proof CSS framework, and that's how it happened. And even if it did stop, we'd probably either look at another one. Um, I think it's called Foundation, maybe. Yep. Um, yep. That it was between those two and Bootstrap One. Uh, we'd change to that, or I would hire someone that's just as good um, to do something that's just as good as Bootstrap. But we chose that for a reason. We wanted to make sure that there was someone better than us creating the best CSS framework that, that there is. And even if they stop doing it, you know, it still exists and will exist. So we're, we're not too fussed about that. Nice segue into the competition. Uh, of course, Alex is giving away a uh, unlimited license of the uh, PDIG 
Bootstrap WordPress development framework, and I'm just looking at it here now on the site. It is valued at $189. So here's the thing. We spoke about this before the interview, and I said to Alex, what do you want to learn from our audience? And he said that you want to learn the, the number one thing that you guys have fixed in your business in the last 12 months. So what was broken in your business, and what's the number one thing that you've been able to turn around and fix and really make good in your business over the last 12 months. So leave your comments underneath the video. Now it could be that you found an awesome theme development framework which has sped up your development time. It could be that you've just gotten better at writing proposals and you're winning more gigs because you know you studied proposal writing. It could be that you hired a bookkeeper who got your accounts in order so you're no longer you know running away from the, the tax office. It could be you know, that you've got a lawyer to write up a good contract so you're not getting screwed over by clients. It could be that you hired a cleaner for the office so you're not doing it on the weekends. It could be anything. What's the number one thing you've fixed? It doesn't have to be WordPress related. What's the number one thing you've fixed in your business over the last 12 months? Leave your comments under the video and I'll get Alex to swing by in a couple of weeks and award the prize. Sound good, man? Sounds great. Awesome. Uh, hey, thank you so much for this interview. Where can people reach out and say thank you, Alex? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Alex Moss. It's very imaginative. Um, you can find me at alex-moss.co.uk or firecast.com. Loads of places. Um, and my email, which is alex at firecast.com. Again, very imaginative. Beautiful. Uh, I think I follow the same approach as you do, man, when I uh, name things. Uh, alex at firecast.co.uk. Uh, awesome. Finally, dot com. Dot com, is it? Although the .co.uk will get oh, to me, go. that's no worries. Firecast.com, perfect, it is too. Um, awesome. And um, so what is the number one piece of advice you would give any entrepreneur trying to build their own business? Um, get your accounts in order. Just make sure that you're on top of them and find something that both you and your accountant likes. Um, and also, even though it's number two tip, find the right management tool. Nice. What is, what is the right management tool? Well, we found as before, we, um, Reich right. is 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 great for, for doing everything, even your life. Um, <laughs> just just your life list of you know, make sure you buy milk on the way home. <laughs> really? Wow, I'm going to have to have another look at Reich. I took I had a look at it a while ago. See, I have a problem. I have not only do I have like shiny object syndrome, but I've also got like I'm swear, I haven't been diagnosed, but I swear I've got adult ADHD. So someone puts a new tool in front of me, and I'm just like, oh, I just can't resist my lizard brain. I just want to play with it. And I th I'm pretty sure I've looked at Reich before. And I didn't really take it for a spin because I didn't want to lose hours of my life. Um, but I might have to have another look at it based on your recommendation. Do, do. And I'm sure you'll be sending me a message later going, I had no sleep last <laughs> night because of this. <laughs> it's all your fault. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for spending some time with us on the WP Elevation podcast. You listeners and viewers don't know, but we had some technical problems during this interview. And Alex has been a consummate professional and just taken it all in his stride. So thank you very much for persisting with us. Uh, I wish you all the best for Firecast and PDIG. And we're definitely going to keep in touch. And I hope to see you at WordCamp Europe or UK or London next year. Um, finally, who would you like me to try and interview and why? Um, I would actually say Pippin, uh, uh, Pippin Williamson. Yes, he is. He's a great guy, and he makes you know, he makes some great, great plugins. Easy Digital Downloads is is amazing, and it powers the um, the way that PDIG is processed and giving out licenses and having an an, up, an upgrade feature within the WordPress backend. You know, that's just one of of the many things that he does, and he, you know, he he makes me look like an idiot. <laughs> he makes most of us look like an idiot. I've met Pippin at Pressnomics. Pippin Williamson, courtesy of Alex Moss, I'm coming to get you. Keep your eyes on your inbox. I'm going to get you on the podcast. So, And I'll send you a link when that interview goes live and close that loop. Hey, man, thanks again for being on the WP Elevation podcast. I wish you all the best for the future. Thanks for having me. I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, I hope you enjoyed meeting Alex Moss as much as I did. Of course, this episode is brought to you by WPElevation.com the uh, world's first business accelerator program for WordPress consultants. There are webinars, there are coaching calls, there are video trainings, uh, there's a private members forum which is full of great stuff. There's guest webinars from people like Chris Lemmer, David Jennings, Brennan Dunn, uh, the list goes on. Uh, we have great partnerships with people like WooThemes and Manage WP and Yoast. Uh, WP Elevation is the place to hang out if you are a WordPress consultant building websites for clients using WordPress. It is the place to come if you want to build a business to support the lifestyle that you want. 
So check out wpelevation.com and come and join in the fun. Subscribe to the podcast at wpelevation.com slash subscribe to make sure you never miss an episode like this one. Uh, of course, all the show notes for this episode will be at wpelevation.com slash alexmoss. It's pretty simple, A-L-E-X-M-O-S-S, where you can watch the video, watch me pulling funny faces, uh, check out Alex in uh, you know the visual and the uh, oral experience. And you can also get all of the links that the things we spoke about, like Reich and um, uh, what else did we speak about? PDIG. And uh, we also spoke about a whole bunch of other stuff um, that I can't remember off the top of my head, but it will all be in the show notes underneath the video. So leave comments underneath the video also for your chance to win a, a unlimited license of PDIG, the Bootstrap WordPress Development Framework, valued at $189. Leave your comment under the video and tell us the number one thing that you have fixed in your business over the last 12 months, and you could win that prize. Alex will swing by in a couple of weeks and award the prize. By the way, we give away a prize every single week on the podcast, and we honor those prizes. Uh, and uh, there are, were a few people recently asking, hmm, do you really give these prizes away? I don't think you do. Well, we do. In that particular instance, we were a bit late giving the prize away because Brian Clark had to award the prize from Copy Blogger, and he was a little bit busy running an authority conference in the States. So he was out of action for a couple of weeks. But I promise you, every time we offer to give a prize away, we give it away. So, enter the competition because you could win $189 worth of PDIG Bootstrap WordPress Development Framework goodies courtesy of Alex Moss. I hope you enjoyed the interview. I have no idea who is on the podcast next week. By the time this goes live, I'll probably know, but right now, I don't. So I hope you're enjoying the podcast. Give us a five-star review at iTunes uh, if you so desire. It really helps us come up in the search results. And until next time, go Elevate.